Well, hello out there in computer land. Welcome to Rising to the Challenge of a Pandemic, a conversation uh, with experts brought to you by Alaska Airlines. Uh, I'm Luke Burbank. I'll be hosting things tonight. Uh, I work on a variety of public radio shows, uh, including Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. I also work on CBS Sunday Morning, but probably my greatest resume achievement is that I am a member of the Alaska Airlines Mileage Club, which I'm very proud of. So I was excited when they asked me to help out with this uh, event tonight. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you that things are quite unique in this moment of our life. Um, you know, the fact that we're doing this on screens tonight is all the indication you need to that point. Um, and you got Thanksgiving, it's like two days away, and then all of the other holidays, and this is the time of year when we're really thinking about being with friends and family. Um, but there's sort of no way around it that it's going to be different this year. So this is the plan for tonight. Uh, Alaska Airlines wanted to get together two of the leading research organizations in the world, which both actually happen to be in Seattle, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and also the University of Washington Medicine, to talk about COVID, to talk about the latest developments, to talk about where we are with the science. Uh, and so we're going to do that. And you're going to get a chance to ask some questions as well. Uh, we're going to be going over a bunch of stuff, including... Uh, how do you stay as safe as possible? Uh, what should you know about testing? And also, uh, what is the truth about vaccines? Which seems to be something that can be a little elusive these days, the actual scientific truth around a lot of this stuff. Um, so we're gonna get to question and answer in just a bit, but first let's introduce some of the uh, experts who are gonna be helping us out tonight. Um, uh, let's start off with uh, Dr. John Lynch, an associate professor of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine and an associate medical director at Harborview. Uh, Dr. Lynch uh, oversees the infection prevention uh, and control programs. And also, uh, Dr. Lynch, you've been advising Alaska Airlines on infectious disease for the last seven years. So this is something that you have been giving a lot of thought to as it relates to Alaska Airlines. What sort of information have you been sharing with them uh, recently? Yeah, thanks, Luke. Well, you know, you say recently it is, when I really think about it, it has been a, a long journey since really since we started talking about in January when Alaska really got engaged. I think uh, like many of us in the United States, but particularly for airlines about how folks were moving throughout the planet, you know, especially from mm -hmm. China and parts of Asia where the, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19 was first rolling out. Um, and really since then, it's been uh, an ongoing conversation that I would say is evolved over time. And as we go through this conversation tonight, I think that's going to be an important concept. We are constantly learning about what's important to prevent transmission in a huge variety of circumstances, from our homes to airlines and airports and buses and trains and office buildings. And I think that's really been the focus of the conversation most recently, taking what we've learned over time and putting it into place in places like airplanes, airports, and similar other uh, areas. Uh, what's the uh, role that air filtration and ventilation uh, play in this whole thing, particularly like on an airplane? Yeah, perfect, because this is exactly one of those areas that I think anybody who's been following the media around COVID-19 knows has been one of those key areas of evolution. How does COVID-19 or the virus SARS-CoV-2 get from one person to another person. Early on, we thought it was mostly these droplets, these heavy, wet particles that we cough or sneeze out, and those land on other people, or we touch them on surfaces and we touch our mouths, our nose, our eyes, and get and you know transmit the virus to ourselves. Over time, what we've learned it's it's still that, but it's also some of these really small particles, these things that float in the air. Sometimes people call them aerosols or small respiratory particles. And what's really important about that is that unlike droplets, those things can be filtered out when we move air around. So when you think about volumes of air, you're thinking about dilution of those particles, right? The greater the air volume there is, the fewer particles there are for you to inhale. But as air is being moved through circulatory systems, like on airplanes or buildings, moving through filters is an additional really important step to get rid of many of those small respiratory droplets uh, as they move through the facilities. All right, uh, Dr. Lynch, if you can stay right where you are, we're going to come back to you in just a moment, though. First, speaking of the air ventilation and all of these different elements that Alaska Airlines is trying to bring to bear to keep people as safe as possible on these airplanes, uh, let's talk to uh, Josh Nice, who is Alaska Airlines Director of Safety and Quality Assurance. 
Uh, Josh is part of the safety team uh, that's been making uh, sure that Alaska's planes and offices and airports are safe for for us, the travelers, and, and for Alaska employees. Um, Josh, a, a big question on everybody's mind, especially with the holiday here. Uh, is it safe to fly? Hi, thanks, Luke. Thanks for having me. Uh, to answer your question, is it safe to fly? Yes, it is safe to fly. Um, as Dr. John Lynch just mentioned, there are a lot of uh, layers that are protecting us. I'd like to bring up that Alaska Airlines, especially if you haven't flown in a while, you should know that there are over a hundred layers of protection that we've incorporated. Uh, as a safety geek, I'll try not to go into too many, but I think some of, some of the ones to feature when you walk into the airports is our mandatory mask policies. We all know the ma mask is a critical control barrier. Um, you'll also see at the airports physical distancing reminders. A lot of our pr processes have moved to touchless ones. Um, we have cleaning before every single flight. And as John mentioned, Dr. John mentioned, uh, we have our HEPA filters on all the aircraft. Uh, these filter out 99.9% .9 of contaminant, excuse me, particulate contaminants, including the coronavirus. And then that coupled with the rapid airflow from top to bottom on our airplanes uh, allows for a refresh of air every two to three minutes. Um, compare this to, you know, 83 minutes for your office place and even more for the uh, for just your indoor environments at your house. I believe it's about 280 minutes. So. Um, studies that have backed this have come out from credible sources like DOD where they ran a very thorough simulation on aircraft and um, so much so that I've told my family that for Thanksgiving we should actually gather on an airplane. So uh, from my standpoint right now, uh, yes, it is safe to fly. You must be like just in your civilian life having so many people just ask you questions like this all the time because like you're kind of the point person for you know, trying to keep people safe up there. What about the topic of eating and drinking on board? Is that safe? Great question. Uh, definitely something that we have considered. Uh, if you've traveled on us, you've noticed we've significantly reduced our food and beverage service on board air aircraft. Um, however, we have returned carefully some of our services. Uh, that's with uh, consultation from Dr. Lynch and also um, after we conduct a thorough safety risk assessment, which is some of a uh, part of my world, um, we we gather together with the right people and we actually think of the mitigations that will help keep our uh, guests safe. Some of the things we've incorporated out of those safety risk assessments include like a menu card. We've redesigned the menu so that you can keep your mask on to order. You uh, point to the item you want or you give a number signal with your fingers on uh, what okay. item you want to order. We also uh, have restricted our purchasing to pre-order, so you're not uh, interacting with uh, with money or anything on board the airplane. Uh, another concept uh, is recommending that guests sip and cover, which is basically if you're not actively eating or drinking, we will will kindly ask you to keep your mask on. Um, speaking of mask compliance, um, if we have a, a guest who's not complying, we do have some tools. Uh, we have the gentle uh, verbal reminder, but then we also have a written card. It's called the yellow card, like a soccer, uh, like in soccer. And uh, our flight attendants and flight crews can use those as kind of a last resort tool if a guest is refusing to comply. So can other passengers play a yellow card or is that left to the Alaska flight? It's the Alaska flight crew. Right. And it's definitely not, no, definitely not something you want to brag about getting. Okay. Uh, Josh, thank you. Uh, stand by because if we have a question come up uh, in the Q&A, that's something that from uh, as our Alaska Airlines representative you can answer. Uh, we will be leaning on you for that. Uh, let's bring another a medical expert into the conversation, Dr. Keith Jerome, uh, who is a virologist at Fred Hutch uh, and the director of the University of Washington's Molecular Virology Laboratory. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Jerome's team's work, the virology lab at the UW School of Medicine has done more than a million COVID-19 tests since early March. Uh, Dr. Jerome, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, a million COVID tests, that sounds like a lot. Is that a lot? That's a lot. And there's, I will tell you that the people in the lab and in our program who've worked so hard to do this, they're really the unsung heroes. They, they work in a lab, you know, across town and they never get to see the, the grateful patients or be thanked. Um, but but people are working incredibly hard and you know we got a nice uh, 
Twitter shout out from the governor, uh, Governor Inslee, when when we hit uh, a million. We're already well over 1.2 million. Um, things are just not slowing down whatsoever. Um, I understand that uh, Fred Hutch and the UW created their own COVID test last February, and this was like before the CDC was really able to scale their version up. Um, how did that affect uh, Washington State's response to the pandemic? Yeah, well, we were actually following this, Luke, back at the end of December when there were the initial reports out of China about this virus and the sequence came out, the the, the, the letters that actually make up the, the code for the virus that came out in early January. And that's when we started. Um, and so through February, we were actually working hard and ready to go. Um, there was a bit of a story that unfortunately we weren't allowed to actually use the test through the month of February until the, the last day of the month. Um, but it, what it did mean is that we were there and ready to go. So as soon as we were allowed, um, we had a test ready to go and we were, you know, all, all cylinders were firing from day one. Um, you know, thank goodness we started preparing early because we were the place where the virus came first to the United States. Uh, what are like, you know, I guess the sort of short version, what are the different kinds of tests that are out there and that are effective right now? <laughs> yeah, well, I can certainly give you a long version of that too, but I won't. You know, there's there's two big give categories. Give us the scientifically <laughs> accurate version, as opposed to something that someone's uncle posted on Facebook. Oh yeah, may, oh, a lot of may, misinformation may not, out there, for sure. So there's two big categories. One is looking for the virus. Do you have COVID right now? And that's usually the swab up your nose. Sometimes it's saliva, different things. Um, and then there's a second category where they take blood, and that's actually looking for the body's response to the virus. That doesn't come typically for a couple of weeks after you had the infection. So we can look backwards. Somebody says, hey, I had this thing in, in the spring. Was it COVID? We can go back and look and tell you yes or no. So most of the tests you're getting, you know, when you go and, and, and you want to get screened, uh, maybe you have symptoms, you get one of these tests looking for the virus. And then there's a bunch of different things within that. Uh, you'll hear a lot about PCR tests. Those are sort of the gold standard, the best tests, really accurate, very sensitive. There's rapid tests, there's antigen tests, and all these have different, different levels of performance um, that it takes really professionals to, to dig through and actually figure out um, how well does a given test perform? And, and, and once we know that, where's the best place to use that test so that it actually uh, does the most benefit for what that test can achieve? Um, what do you think the future of testing looks like? I've heard about, you know, some uh, home tests that, that people now may be able to do. I mean, where is this going to end up in your professional opinion? Yeah, there is this home test. It's it's not broadly available right now, um, only in a couple of areas of the country in, in, in defined medical practices. Um, it'll be a few months before it's widely available. Um, home testing would be great. Um, that test costs about $50 a shot, which means you're probably not going to do it super often. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, labs like ours continue to grow capacity to do more and more. Uh, we did over 13,000 earlier this week in a single day. Um, you know, we're pooling so we, we can actually um, combine. Uh, if, if we think these are relatively low risk people, we combine them into one test. And and if it's negative, everybody's negative. If it's, if it's positive, we go back and figure out who was the positive person there. Um, but I'm really excited about our really inexpensive tests that can be done at home where you could actually think financially about being able to do it every single day um, mm. you know so that we can really catch infections early you know the problem here is people become infectious before they feel sick and that's why this virus is spreading so well it's very hard to catch those folks um, so if we have tests like that and there is some technology out there that promises that um, it might be an additional way that we could have another layer of protection like we were hearing about um, just more to tide us over until I think we get these vaccines in hand, which is really going to be our way out. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of which, we have another expert waiting in the wings, Dr. Jerome. Just stay where you are, too. Uh, let's bring uh, Dr. Michelle Andrasik uh, into things here. Dr. Andrasik is Director of Community Engagement for the Hutch based HIV vaccine trials network and also for the five COVID 19 vaccine trials that are being coordinated by the Hutch. Uh, and Dr. Andrasik's work has focused on HIV prevention and the social and structural factors that cause health uh, inequities. This has been a huge part of this story is how much uh, harder this has hit uh, communities of color. Uh, Dr. Andrasik, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, can you explain uh, what the Hutch's role in managing the vaccine trials kind of is and 
and and how they're sort of the authority on vaccine coordination? Yeah, so we have been coordinating um, HIV vaccine trials for um, several decades now. So we have a really well-established infrastructure to move the trials forward. Uh, so we are uh, doing central operations, uh, tasked with community engagement and um, site clinical research site support. Uh, so we are taking sort of our longstanding relationships that we formed in the decades of HIV vaccine research and coordination and utilizing that infrastructure uh, to move the COVID vaccines forward. Um, what is the, the status of the vaccines? So as many of you have seen, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have shown um, 90 to 95% efficacy. I think it's really critical to understand though what that efficacy means. That efficacy is showing prevention of severe disease progression, not at this time prevention of infection. And I think that's an important and critical point. So what we know now is that the two uh, messenger RNA vaccines that are being tested by Pfizer and Moderna are 95% effective in um, preventing severe disease progression. So when you are infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID disease, your chances of progressing to severe disease, which require hospitalization and potential death, um, are greatly reduced. So later when we see um, an emergency use authorization, what we will likely see is that the distribution and dissemination of vaccines will be targeting those individuals who are at greatest risk of um, exposure and severe disease progression. So frontline workers, people who are older, 65 and older, and, and so forth. So when we hear this news, which is very promising around a lot of these vaccines um, that, that they're being developed and that they are showing efficacy, uh, we should temper that with the kind of realistic timeline of when it will be widely available to, you know, like, you know, radio hosts, people like that. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's incredibly promising. I mean, the, these efficacy results show that, you know, our focus on targeting the spike protein of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus is, is uh, probably the right way forward. But I think we, we also need to keep in mind that um, we still don't know and won't know for quite some time whether or not this um, the vaccines prevent infection. So it is, um, you know, likely that we can still be infected with SARS-CoV-2 with these vaccines. And if you are infected, then you can still transmit the virus. So I think, you know, that it's really important for people to keep that in mind, you know, that we're still going to have to wash our hands. We're still going to have to wear our masks and physically distance for quite some time. Uh, there is uh, in this country uh, a, a fair amount of suspicion around things like vaccines, uh, despite what seems to be their pretty clear beneficial effects. Uh, what do you tell people uh, when they ask you if these vaccines are safe or how you can be sure that they're safe? Well, I uh, we have a lot of information about the safety mechanisms that are in place. So I generally start there with the safety mechanisms that we have in place, uh, the data safety and monitoring boards and discussing all of the various ethical um, rules and regulations that have been put in place to address some of the unethical behaviors that have happened in the past. And I also underscore the fact that um, sp individual scientists in historically have been unethical. And science has done a lot to ensure that there are checks and balances in place so unethical behavior cannot move forward.
word, you know, unchecked. And I think that that's really critical. You know, we point um, people um, to the Helsinki Declaration and to good participatory practices and all of the various strides that we have made in science to ensure uh, an ethical way forward for all of us. So you, there you feel there are a lot of sort of institutional controls uh, that are there to make sure that one or a couple of bad actors can't actually put something out to the public. Yes. And I also know from my years in science that there are way more, infinitely more ethical and morally um, compass driven individuals than there are the unethical individuals. So just from, you know, anecdotally and, um, you know, in terms of what we have in place, uh, there are many checks that ensure safety and ensure, you know, um, and work towards inclusion as well and diversity right. in our trials. Which actually is the next thing I wanted to ask you about. I know a big focus of your work is really trying to create a diverse group of people participating, uh, you know, in studies and development of various medicines and vaccines. Historically, why has that been such a challenge or, or what are the things that are sort of structurally have been working against more people of color in particular, um, you know, getting the, the treatment that they deserve? Yeah, well, I, this goes back to your previous question. You know, the indigenous racial and ethnic minority communities in this country that are hardest hit by COVID-19 and, you know, numerous other diseases share a legacy of abusive policies and practices that not only create social and economic circumstances that compromise their health, but compromise their general well-being. And this reality is coupled with the fact that these communities continue to experience um, economic marginalization and there's a relative lack of inclusion and representation in science and medicine, which have fostered a mistrust of medical and research establishments. And what we have found to be true is one way to overcome that is actually including individuals in research efforts. Not only does it increase knowledge and familiarity with the research process, but it builds relationships between community members and research institutions. It increases the availability of important resources for the larger community. And I think most importantly, it cultivates trust in research. Um, and we've seen that in HIV research, we're seeing it now in COVID research. And, you know, I think to underscore one of the critical um, factors that we find to really move the needle towards trust is providing resources and information for communities so that they have what they need to make informed decisions about their health, the health of their families, and their communities. And that's been incredibly challenging with the politicization of the, the vaccine efforts and COVID generally. Um, I know that that one of the things we were hoping uh, to accomplish tonight was to encourage people, you know, of, of all backgrounds, particularly though people in marginalized communities, uh, to, if possible, take part in these things for the reasons that you're pointing out. Is there, if, do you have a piece of advice for the various folks who are, you know, you know, watching this from wherever people are watching this as far as how they can participate? Yeah, the, the best way to do that is to go to preventcovid.org. We have a registry there. Uh, on every page, you'll see a little button that says volunteer now, preventcovid.org. And we ask you to take a very brief survey, which will help us determine um, your risk factors and uh, be able to identify if you're a good match for any of the um, vaccine products that are currently um, being tested. And then one of our sites will uh, reach out to you in your area. You know, and I think it's, it, it's critical, you know, especially for those of us who are um, in hardest hit areas uh, we really need individuals who are from hardest hit communities so we can understand the efficacy of these products on communities that are hardest hit. So it's really critical 
Um, you know, particularly if you have, you know, you're uh, around people uh, a lot and so your exposure is high, uh, you would be a very good match for uh, some of the um, research that we are doing now in uh, the CoVPN. All right, so if you're watching this right now and you have that generalized feeling of helplessness that all of us who don't work in medicine or epidemiology, I think feel a lot of the time right now, this is a way uh, that you could uh, that that you could feel like you were maybe taking back some of that uh, some of that control and, and helping us, us all get to a solution because I think we're all pretty ready for this pandemic to be over. Um, I think the folks watching this wherever they are, are pretty ready to start with the question and answer uh, phase. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take your questions. Um, uh, I believe in the uh, chat function there, uh, you can you can see where the button is to ask a question. We we sent an email out a little bit earlier uh, soliciting questions, and I think we got like almost a thousand questions. So between those thousand or so questions and uh, what folks are going to be uh, sending in the next half hour or so, we're not going to get to everyone, but we'll get to as many as we can. Also, uh, some of those questions will be answered on the Alaska Airlines blog coming up. So if you submit a question, and we're not able to get to it tonight, uh, there still may be a chance for you to get that um, question answered. I see, by the way, before we jump into the Q&A though, uh, Dr. Lynch, I see by this delicious uh, graphic that they're putting up on the screen, uh, there is something called the Swiss cheese virus defense that Alaska has been uh, putting into place. Can you explain what that actually means? Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of people think about, you know, uh, these sort of multi-layer models or these Swiss cheese defense. I know the airline industry uses this model all the time. And a wonderful virologist by the name of Ian McKay in Australia uh, sort of crowdsourced this. And he's actually got a, one now that's, I think, 15 or 18 layers deep, split into uh, personal responsibilities and society responsibilities. But this one, I think, really goes to the questions that I think uh, may come up around how safe is an airplane, how safe, you know, is an airport. And it goes back to Josh's point that it's, you know, this isn't 100 layers like Josh is talking about, and there's there are many, many layers. But these are some of the concrete layers that I think about when I think about how do we make flying safer. And I want to really emphasize it is not one thing. It's not even masking by itself, right? We We, we focus a lot on masking. We in the hostels we focus on uh, you know eye protection and so forth, but it's it's everything from the time you before you leave your house to you get to your destination and back. How do I feel that day? Hoping you know we don't want people to come to the airport not feeling well. Are you taking uh, you know mass transit on the way to the airport? How much time are you spending there for? Are you eating? Are you drinking? Right? Are you in crowded areas getting your tickets or something similar? Uh, you know what is it like going through TSA? What is it like on the plane itself? Um, where does testing fit into all of that? You know, like we know about Hawaii and Alaska right now. What is the spacing on the planes? The touch-free innovations that Josh just talked about, right? Not handing things back and forth, no cash, no menus, um, you know, are all really important parts. And when you line up many, many, many layers, right? And this is actually, you know, a subset of those layers. When you add up lots of layers, that's where you see effective reductions, you know, and we hope in many cases, elimination of transmission between individuals. And so this is the Swiss cheese model. You line it all up and you ne hopefully never, if you have enough of these slices, the holes never align and the virus can't get through. But that's really the important take home. It's no one thing is gonna get us through this, testing or masking or even the vaccine that Mac, uh, Michelle's talked about. It's a lot of things all the time going forward. Uh, we have a question that's come in uh, that Dr. Jerome, I think, could answer. Uh, this person is wondering, they say their son lives abroad. He had COVID a month ago and has recovered. If he's exposed to COVID while traveling, can he be a carrier for COVID infecting other people, even though he has antibodies? If so, how long uh, would he need to quarantine? Uh, do you have a thought on that, Dr. Jerome? Yeah, you know, we're still trying to understand what it means to be protected by having COVID, um, you know, we're learning that there is some protection from that for sure. Um, and that informs what we what we think uh, getting a vaccine will be. And, and so I think the unfortunate answer is we're not completely sure. I think the likely answer is that's going to provide him some protection from getting sick. Um, 
it, it probably keeps him from making as much virus as he would otherwise if he does get exposed and infected. Um, but we just don't know enough to be sure and enough, we don't know enough to be able to say there's no risk in that. And so, again, you sort of get back to this Swiss cheese model. Maybe that is sort of a layer of Swiss cheese that that's a little bit of protection, but it might have some holes and we just don't really know how big those holes are right now. Um, uh, this is a question that came in actually for Josh Nice, our Alaska Airlines uh, safety expert. Uh, this person wanted to know what all on the plane inside the plane gets washed down. Like what is the process for making one of those airplanes as, as safe and virus free as possible? Yeah, thanks, Luke. Yeah, to, to cover what we clean on the airplanes, uh, I think I, it, it helps to go back and just say that we took a holistic view at all of our cleaning processes as a result of COVID. Uh, the turn process, that's the, that's the time when the airplane's on the ground. We didn't typically um, you know, spend a ton of time cleaning, but now we do a thorough uh, cleaning of all the surfaces that folks will be touching, especially focusing on using elbow grease as uh, Dr. Uh, John Lynch has shared with us, the, the virus does not like uh, when, you, when you scrub it. So we use elbow grease on the high touch point areas, such as the panel above your head, the armrests next to you, um, and any of the areas that you might be, um, the, the tray table, any of those items that you might be touching, even the seat belt. Um, what's for the overnight when we have more time with the airplanes, we do a very thorough uh, cleaning of all those touch points and the carpets and the other um, areas that we didn't cover during the turns. Um, and I'm actually excited to share that we have found a chemical that's safe to use on the airplanes that actually protects the airplane for um, from the COVID virus from living on surfaces for up to 24 hours. And we will apply that uh, with an electrostatic cleaner for all of our RON, we call it Remain Overnight Aircraft. Oh, wow. What is that thing called? Do you know the name of it? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Biotrol 24, I believe is the official name. And That was so my guess too. I just wanted to see if you knew the name. Okay. <laughs> uh, you passed the test, Josh. Um, here's a question that came in for Dr. Andrasik. Uh, if a person has one type of COVID-19 vaccine, would it be okay to have a different type of COVID-19 vaccine later? Um, it, what, what, would the, what would the ruling on that be, uh, Dr. Andrasik? Uh, currently, we are um, not aware of, you know, what, how the vaccines will interact. Certainly, if someone is in one of our trials, we are asking them not to join another vaccine trial. And uh, we, there are so many um, more questions than answers that we have at the moment. And I think, you know, as we get further along and we see, you um, you know, the immune data. Uh, and, you know, I want to just, um, you know, point out that what we're seeing now is interim data. You know, we only have one vaccine study in the U.S. that's fully enrolled. Uh, and not everyone in that study has completed even their second vaccination or their, and none of them have completed the follow-up period. And then all of the other um, NIAID funded studies are currently being enrolled. So there are many questions that we still have to answer. And as we get the data, we will be able to answer these um, but unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot answer them, but we, I, we would advise not to take more than one vaccine at the moment. Okay. I mean, if you're lucky enough to have access to any vaccine, right. I mean, exactly. it'd be, it'd be, you, you're really okay. somebody special, I guess, if you've got your pick of two. Um, here's a question that's come in um, that maybe uh, Dr. Lynch, you'd be able to answer. Someone's asking, there's so much focus on cleaning but yet it seems that there's little evidence for contacting the viruses by surfaces. Is all this expensive and laborious cleaning? I feel like this question is a bit of an assault on Josh Nice, but we're gonna leave that out of it. Is all this expensive and laborious cleaning really necessary? Well, you know, as I mentioned before, this conversation, the, the watchword has been evolution. We, we learned about this early on, the conversations that we had with, uh, you know, the Alaska Airlines team was to, you know, let's go for all of these possibilities, you know, from from masking to distancing to, you know, every all the other tools that we've we've got in place. The Alaska team, I think, did a great job. You know, Josh has actually been a little bit humble. 
They got a lot more people doing this work, working a lot faster. I was able to go down and watch these teams work on planes, and they're really effective in turning them over and getting mater you know, the cleaning materials and the elbow grease, as he said, to lots and lots of surfaces. You're right. We've learned now that probably what's called fomite or contact transmission is probably a much less of an important role, but it's not zero, right? This is why hand hygiene is still super important. We should still all be washing our hands frequently. And we also have to remember that planes have people move through them, right? They're, you know, you have one flight and then another flight. And I think that, you know, when we think about those situations, unlike say sitting in an office or something similar, cleaning between people's presence makes still makes some sense. And if it is part of that Swiss cheese model, right? It's one more, maybe it's not the thickest one, maybe it's the one, not the one with the fewest holes, but it's still, I think, an important part of the whole process. Um, here's a question uh, that Dan submitted uh, for Dr. Jerome. It's a sort of a basic question, but I mean, it's a very important question. Uh, if you think you might have been exposed to the virus, how long do you wait to get a test? Yeah, well, one thing to, to remember there is there's not a perfect time. Uh, this is a tough question and a real world question is important that we deal with. And, and, and so we sort of give ranges. The issue here is that if you test too soon after you've been exposed, even if you're infected, there's not enough virus for a test to detect. Um, so we're trying to wait until there's enough virus for the test to become positive, but still get it early enough so that it's useful to you and that you know you 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 make it uh, I mean, you make the diagnosis. So usually we tell people to that sort of the sweet spot is five to seven days. That's where if if people are infected on average, they they they're starting to actually get sick. That's when the virus is at the highest level. So you're likely to see it. But even even waiting that long, it's not a perfect test. And some people have clearly become detectable later than that. So that would be too early for some, but that's sort of our, our best advice as to when is the optimal time to go. Is that um, a kind of, I guess, imprecise timeline? Is that part of how false positive and false negatives come about? How do those happen? Yeah. Um, so, you know, those of us who actually run those labs sometimes chafe a little bit at that idea of false negatives mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it, early on, there probably is really, you know, immediately after infection, there's, there's, there's essentially no virus there. It hasn't actually begun this process of replicating itself and making all these copies that, that we can detect and ultimately go on to infect other people. Um, and any laboratory tests that we perform has limitations, they're not perfect as much as we wish they were. Um, there has to be a certain amount of virus there to detect that. If you're infected, but you have less than that, we just won't see it. If the person- So it's not a false swab, negative. It just doesn't no, rise no. to the level of detectability. Yeah, oh, for sure. So there's a biology there. Now there are truly false negatives, something, you know, I mean, things can happen. Um, the person doing the swab doesn't uh, get that, you know, it doesn't do it vigorously enough or, you know, gets the wrong, puts the wrong one in, puts in the wrong two, mislabels things. There are things like that. They're they're rare. We have processes to prevent them. They're kind of analogous, I think, to some of the things the airline industry has actually pioneered. Uh, the medical fields learned a lot from error reduction from the airline industry, um, so we reduce those. Um, but but there is biology and there's biologic variability that makes this an Im an imperfect process to diagnose the infection. I was having a test uh, done a little while ago, and I have to say the person was being fairly gentle with my nostril, and I was appreciative of that. But I also <laughs> was wondering if, you know, if it was going to be uh, fully accurate because of yeah. what was not that uncomfortable of a process. I understand the mixed feelings for sure. Yeah, there. right. I want a good test. So, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Here's a here's a question for Dr. Andrasik, uh, because uh, you've worked so much with uh, HIV. Doctor, um, someone wonders uh, how does vaccine does the vaccine work in unison with people living with HIV and AIDS and their current medications uh, and those with pre-existing conditions? Uh, again, we don't have enough data to say anything about that. Um, as as you may know, uh, we are um, focusing on individuals with 
pre-existing conditions um, because they are at high risk for severe disease uh, progression. So certainly people living with HIV are, um, you know, uh, a priority population in the work that we're doing in COVID. And again, we um, will we'll need to see what, ha you know, what the um, interactions are with uh, medications that are being taken just as we will with any participants who have a pre-existing condition. Okay, um, here's a question, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Lynch, that you'd be able to answer. Somebody is wondering, how long does the antibody remain in your body? Uh, can you be tested still today and get accurate results uh, for the antibodies you might have had back in March. There seems to be a large amount of the U.S. population, I know many of them, who are pretty sure, at least in their own theories, that they had it before we were talking about it the way we talk about it now, and they wonder if they have antibodies. How, how long do the antibodies stay in your body? Yeah, I think I'm going to tag team this with Dr. Jerome, if you don't mind, Keith. Um, so, you know, we've remember, we are coming up on a year of knowing anything about this virus and this disease. And so that's how much data we have. Uh, antibody you know, data didn't come out until a bit later. What I've learned in our UW medicine work, you know, we did a big uh, study of all of our healthcare workers uh, during the summer. And in that process, we definitely had people who had positive tests in the spring and had negative antibody tests in the summer. And people who never remembered having an illness who were positive in the summer. And we know that from various observational studies, these are studies that just collect data, not in a forward thinking way like the ones that Dr. Andrzejczyk is working on, but really looking at what's happened in the past. Um, and we know that in healthcare worker populations where a lot of these antibody tests have been done, a large number of them seem to have lose their antibody positivity within you know months of their initial infection. Uh, having said that, we'd still have lots of people out there who have positive antibodies for months and months and months. So uh, with that observational perspective, I don't know, Keith, what you'd like to add to that. Well, I think you've summed up what we know pretty well, John. I mean, it's very clear. We, we've, we've followed sets of people over time and the antibody does, we say it wanes. It just means the levels go down over time. And for some people, they, they do become undetectable. Um, those are often people who had more mild COVID. There seems to be some association. If you were very, very sick with it, your body makes more antibody to fight it off and it lasts longer. Um, so, you know, the antibody can certainly last for months. Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's likely that, that on average it's going to last six months or more, but some people will be more, some people will be less. Um, one thing that's important to remember is don't get too pessimistic about this idea that the antibodies go away. The antibodies are only one part of, 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 the, of the way the immune system fights against the body. And there is emerging data that a different kind of immune cell called a T cell actually can mm -hmm. live longer um, and, and, and may provide uh, substantial protection for a much longer period than the antibodies alone. So we really don't, know, you know, if the antibodies go away, you may still have some protection and we really need to figure that out, but we just haven't had enough time to follow that yet. It's a very important question and lots of people are working on it very actively. Uh, here's a question for Josh Nice from Alaska Airlines. Um, how often is Alaska replacing a cabin air with outside air? And is that something that like varies from airline? Is it an industry standardized thing? Uh, how often is that air sort of swapped out? Yeah, thanks, Luke. So um, the the equation's a little bit confusing as maintenance describes it to me, but basically the engines are drawing in a combination of uh, of outside air. When you're at altitude, you know you can't breathe in that oxygen uh, la lack of oxygen air, but you are also getting the HEPA filtered air uh, simultaneously. Um, what what I feel comfortable quoting them as uh, is that you're getting that refreshed air every two to three minutes, but 100% outside air after six minutes. Again, that's uh, dramatically um, short uh, time period compared to other environments that we are in outside of an airplane. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, Dr. Andrasik, here's a, a question. Well, one, just on a practical level, somebody is wondering if volunteering uh, uh, would involve a drive to Seattle? Do, do people have to go somewhere to be part of the research that you're working on? 
Uh, no, we have um, over 200 sites around the country. And we have three actually in Seattle um, the, the, and yes, in uh, Washington State, uh, the three are located here in um, the Seattle King County area. But one of those sites has a mobile unit that they are utilizing to go out into uh, communities so that communities won't have to make the drive into Seattle. And again, the best way to get matched with a site that's near you is uh, to go to that preventcovid.org and sign up for the registry and have someone um, give you a call back. Okay, um, here's a, another question, Dr. Anjasek, for you. Uh, somebody is wondering, uh, do you see any of the vaccines that are currently in the pipeline as actually preventative? And uh, when will the current vaccines enter the peer reviewed process? Uh, or will that be bypassed? And then they said, thanks, Alaska Airlines, for this great webinar. Uh, so you're welcome, whoever that is. Um, but more importantly, Dr. Andresik, are, are any of these vaccines, do you see any on the horizon that are that are preventative? Well, I think it's important to remember that the primary objective of these vaccines is the prevention of severe disease progression. And the secondary objective is prevention of infection. We won't, however, know if the vaccines prevent infection until we have more data over a longer period of time, because we need to look, you know, at the immune response over, um, you know, a, a significantly longer period of time. So we're hoping that sometime in early next year, and I don't want to make any promises, but that's what we're hoping that we'll have the data um, and the you know, the really great thing about these trials and why it's so important to get people enrolled is that, you know, the, the more people we have and the more outcomes we see, the better able we are to, to look at the immune response to the vaccine. So, um, you know, those of us who are doing HIV research are used to these sort of 5,000 person trials. So these 30,000 people trials will help us get there a lot quicker. Um, uh, this is a question uh, that I have been curious about myself. I think we probably are all are as we move through the world these days. Uh, this might be one that Dr. Lynch could answer. Uh, somebody is wondering how important is wearing the right kind of mask or wearing a single use mask only once or washing a cloth mask uh, that is not washed every day? I guess the kind of nature of the question is, uh, are, are all masks created equal? I think, Luke, you cut out, but I think that one was for me. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, sure. If, if you don't mind okay, uh, grabbing this, Dr. Lynch. Yeah, if, if yeah, no I mean, yes. did you hear the question? I did. I think, um, please steer me wrong, steer me, steer me right uh, if I go off in the wrong direction. But yes, there's, when we think about the filtration properties of all the different materials we are wearing over our mouth and nose, important to remember, mouth and nose, both yes. of those count. Um, none of the nose peeking over. Um, those they do they do have different filtration, and we have to also recognize that medical masks, and uh, you may have heard about these respirators, N95s and higher, they have a combination of both mechanical properties, so the way they're built, but also things like electrostatic properties and uh, fluid resistance properties that add you know greater layers of protection. Now I would say that you know the data is, is swung all over the place uh, over the past six months. Uh, from, you know, cloth masks and neck gaiters don't work to, oh, yes, they do. What I would say is that all of these uh, face coverings from both the technical to the non-technical do interrupt both transmission and acquisition. So both prevent stuff coming out of someone and infecting someone else, but also me getting infected. So it's as, as someone said who is much smarter than me, wearing a mask is is uh, is a message of love, right? It's showing respect and humility and love for your neighbor uh, and caring for yourself. Um, and any of these things are going to be helpful. And as you do go up that hierarchy, they're going to get better and better. And that's why in hospitals and clinics uh, and in vaccine studies, they're wearing medical masks. And in some cases, we're in the respirators for additional protection. Got it. Um, here's a question, uh, Dr. Jerome, for you. And I'm going to be honest with you. This has already exceeded my knowledge around the the COVID 
a virus. So I'm obviously this person watching this wants the answer, and I'm going to hope you know the answer. They write yeah, esteemed okay. scientists. <laughs> I'm really teeing this one up for you. Esteemed scientists and even Dr. Fauci's own study says that the PCR should not be used to diagnose because it is amplified so greatly that it'll give overwhelming amounts of false positives and can't be distinguished between when you are contagious or if you've had any coronavirus at all. Uh, if the test is faulty, then the data is flawed. Um, what is your response to that uh, question slash statement? Yeah, well, there's parts in there that are true, and then there, yeah. there are parts that are probably overinterpreted, just, okay. you know, to, 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 to put science speak on it. So it's very clear that these are, the PCR tests are extremely sensitive. Yep. What are the PCR tests if, for for oh, those of us? Oh, sure. Who are so P PCR is is the is the jargon we use. It stands for something called polymerase chain reaction. And essentially, if you have um, really anything you want to detect that has nucleic acid in it, DNA or RNA, um, you basically take a little tiny region, not the whole thing, just a little region that's within what you're interested in finding. Maybe you've seen this in uh, some of these like crime shows, right? You want to see sure. kind of DNA from the criminal. Uh, well, in this case, the virus is the criminal. It's just a little tiny piece of it. And essentially, we we amplify that. It means we take, if the virus has 100 copies in somebody, we turn that into a million and then 10 million. And as the n number of, of, of copies of that little tiny region um, increase, we can detect it in our instruments. It actually glows, it fluoresces. Oh, wow. So our instruments can see that. That little piece isn't infectious, so we're not making more virus, but it allows us to detect it. So the issue here is that because we can amplify 100 copies into a million, we can also amplify 10 copies into 100 million. So the question is, are 10 copies of something actually infectious or not? And um, for certain viruses, it's just critically important to get every last one. For HIV, for example, we want to know, you know, is there any virus there whatsoever? And so we, we we ramp the tests up as much as we can. For COVID, what we've learned through the process is that, um, particularly in the people on sort of the backside of their illness, they've gotten better now. They want to get out of the hospital. Uh, early on, we were saying, well, you can't leave. You can't go see anybody till your PCR is negative. Okay. And for some people, that took a really long time for that to happen. There were little remnants, of just enough virus to detect. What we learned over time was they weren't infecting anybody, basically. Um, so some people say, oh, that's dead virus. Uh, you know, maybe it's dead. Maybe it's fragments of virus. Maybe it's just not enough to ever cause an infection. Um, so so we've really learned to look at how much virus is there um, and to really not overinterpret what we're finding. So, you know, we're learning. As scientists, we try to be humble. We, we try to not say we have all the answers. And what we what we learn and think we know is always subject to change as more information comes along. All right, we have time for one more question. And I guess because we started things off with Dr. Lynch, we're going to end things with him uh, in the sort of book ending things fashion. Um, this is from someone who asks anonymously, are there any treatments that our doctors can easily prescribe that minimize the impact of the disease if we get COVID? Yeah, sure. I, I'm going to answer that. But I, just to follow up on Keith's comment, the, the other thing that's really important to recognize is that as we're seeing more people with positive tests in UW Medicine, we're seeing more people in the hospital with COVID-19. A few weeks ago, we were about 20 patients in our system per day, and we're now up over 80 patients per day. And you can see that that trend follows the positive tests. So these tests, yes, they are incredibly sensitive but when interpreted correctly are incredibly meaningful uh, mm -hmm. and incredibly helpful for, for diagnosing patients and figure out who needs to get treated, which is your question. So we've gone through a lot of potential treatments this year. Again, a lot of this has been in the media, you know, uh, azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine. Um, more recently, you know, we've been using this drug called remdesivir, which is a drug that's mm -hmm. really focused on treating viruses specifically. Um, and the other one that's uh, in common use for now is called dexamethasone. It's a type of steroid. Uh, the remdesivir drug, you know, we've seen some signals that it's very helpful. Some m newer studies, more recent studies, not so compelling. And some of the national and international bodies that make recommendations around treatments here in the United States and, and elsewhere have, uh, as they've gone through time and gotten more data, have felt less compelled to recommend 
that particular drug, including the WHO, which currently doesn't actually recommend the use of that drug in the treatment of people with COVID-19. So we don't know where that really stands right now, though it's in common use. Dexamethasone is a drug that's being used uh, in people who are severely ill. Often people go into the ICU who require high levels of oxygen. And again, we think it does appear to help. We're gonna need more time, but both those drugs are in common use. There are lots of other candidates out there. Some of those drugs like azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine have been proved very definitively to be not helpful in the care of patients with COVID-19, including great studies done here in Seattle. Um, and I'm sure there's more drugs in the pipeline to look at in the future, hopefully drugs that target this virus specifically. But right now, I think the thing that's probably making the most difference for patients is the bedside clinicians, the respiratory therapists, the nurses, the critical care doctors, acute care doctors, who have learned how to take care of patients, learned how to check oxygen levels, when to give oxygen, when to put people on their bellies, what we call proning, and when to you know, put uh, tubes in people uh, in their throat to help them breathe. And I think all that clinical knowledge is really what we're seeing help patients more than anything else right now. And then there's just all the stuff that healthcare providers are learning that's on the maybe less medical, but more human level. I, I for my TV job, interviewed a doctor in uh, Pennsylvania who started putting a picture of himself on his PPE, you know, because he's dealing with people who are seeing someone in this very imposing outfit. And just that thing of seeing a human face that the patients could identify with being inside of that PPE, those little things are these amazing, ingenious ways that medical professionals are just figuring this out as we go along. Yeah, the, the humanity that uh, frontline healthcare workers and all the support staff are bringing to the care of their patients in the midst of this pandemic is astounding. You know, I, I'm a, what I call, I'm a healthcare epidemiologist. I'm a programmatic operational person. I'm not at the bedside. My job is to keep them safe. And I'm continuously inspired by uh, the folks at the bedside. But, you know, to be clear, I'm also wildly inspired by the scientists by the folks doing the vaccine studies, you know, the stuff that's working uh, that, that the lab is doing. I, I, I can't even, I could spend hours talking about how incredibly life-saving uh, the tests that that lab medicine team has put together and how that really uh, saved us, you know, early on and, and, and continuously right now. And I'm, I can't wait to 2021 and Dr. Andrasik's work being out there in the world to, you know, help turn this, stem the tide of this pandemic. Um, it is a wildly tiring, exhausting, and inspiring time to be in this field. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, well, Dr. Lynch, thank you for everything you've been doing, and thanks for being part of this conversation tonight. Also, big thanks uh, to Dr. Uh, Jerome and also Dr. Andrasik, and to our friend Josh Nice from Alaska Airlines. Thank you to uh, everyone who watched and submitted questions. Again, if you didn't get your question answered, uh, these uh, some of these questions will get answered at the Alaska Airlines blog uh, in the next, uh, I think, a few days. So look for it there. Also, if you want to get more involved in the Hutch's research uh, or subscribe to get news alerts, you can go to fredhutch.org slash sign up. So that's a little bit of um, useful information for you here uh, at the end of what has been a lot of really good useful scientifically based info, which is always nice to have during a pandemic. Uh, thanks again. Uh, please have a great holiday. Stay safe, take care of yourselves. And remember, we're going to get through this together. Have a great night, everybody.